Um, so I think we're going to start just on time. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk about how to organize uh, data engineering around uh, Kubeflow. Um, I'm also going to explain what Kubeflow is, if you don't know. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Matthias Manninger. Uh, right now, I'm working for uh, Avalon by Devo Team in Stockholm as a solution engineer, basically a consultant. Um, and we help uh, customers uh, start uh, or continue their data science journey. And we are actually a Google Cloud partner. Uh, so I do most of my work uh, working with uh, Google Cloud uh, technologies. We help lots of customers um, move into the cloud and uh, start experiencing uh, all the benefits of the cloud and uh, do data science there uh, because it's a very nice place to start your data journey. Um, and uh, we are helping lots of uh, big traditional businesses who face many challenges when it comes to, to data science, uh, machine learning, uh, because they have a very rigid uh, architecture. Um, they had, everything is very really spread out, uh, different applications. Um, so they have different environments. It's a very, very tough uh, spot to be in. And they have uh, traditional big teams. They want to collaborate. And uh, machine learning, uh, when it comes to machine learning, it can be hard. So we help uh, all these customers uh, with their problems. Uh, yeah, so I would like you to take out your phone. Uh, don't put them away just yet. And go to menti.com, uh, which is a website. And we're going to do this. So you go to menti.com, you enter this code, so 33166. And then answer the question. You can uh, submit multiple answers. And basically, I would like to know what is uh, your experience with machine learning going into production, um, developing something that can be used in a production pipeline. What are your challenges? If you're working in a team, what are your challenges around that? And uh, hopefully, all the answers are going to appear on the screen. Let's say you have two minutes to add answers. Yeah, so many things, uh, life cycle management, uh, repeatability, model management, uh, natural language processing, scale, uh, deployment, monitoring, knowledge. All right, so we see deployment, monitoring, knowledge, data. Yeah, of course, that's a, that's a big problem when it comes to data science. <laughs> Also, when you're a consultant, the biggest problem is also always the, the customer. So <laughs> you always wish you, you didn't have to deal with those things. All right. Um, so I think we, we, have, a, we have a nice uh, understanding of where we're coming from. So deployment, uh, monitoring, scaling, uh, life cycle management, uh, versioning, putting it into production. So all these different challenges. and. Uh, I let this run, um, but you're probably better off putting your phone away now and listening to me. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, um, when it comes to machine learning, you have to develop your model, and that's, of course, a challenge. Uh, many people learn years to develop uh, the correct model, but then you have lots of other parts of the pipeline that you have to worry about, data ingestion, data transformation, cleaning the data, hyperparameter tuning, evaluating your, your model, training the model, validating, deploying the model. And this is just a, a small subset of, of uh, this is just the, the theoretical pipeline. And then there are, there are other problems, like um, what is the infrastructure you're running on? How do you collaborate? Um, how, how do you put it into production? Uh, dependencies, uh, CI/CD pipeline around the whole thing. So it can get really messy, and you need lots of different expertise 
um, in many, many different areas of uh, computer science just to, to be able to deploy a, a, an ML model into production. It's not as easy as hiring one uh, machine learning scientist with a PhD. Um, the, probably they're not going to write such a good uh, production-ready code, or they will not have a good understanding of CI/CD. Uh, so, so yeah, it's hard. Uh, and basically, uh, Kubeflow is uh, what's going to what, what they are going, uh, trying to do is to make scaling machine learning models and deploying them to production as simple as possible. So it's trying to solve all these problems that you guys wrote down and uh, what I've been trying to explain so far. Um, just a, a quick recap. Uh, how many of you have used uh, Kubernetes or know what Kubernetes is? So that's around like maybe two thirds of, of everyone. So basically, Kubernetes um, is uh, uh, you can think of it as the operating system for your uh, containers. What you want to do is you want to containerize all your applications and then deploy them on your uh, servers. But if you have multiple computers, you want to connect them together and you have to do lots of bookkeeping. Okay, which container is running where? How many instances are running of this container when you're scaling? Uh, are they really running healthy? So you have to, to do monitoring around that, uh, you have to scale it up, scale it down, maybe do this automatically. So all these things that you don't want to do by hand, uh, you don't want to care about these Kubernetes handlers. So you have a Kubernetes master, you just tell it, hey, here are my containers, I want this to have, I don't know, three, three of these containers running all the time, five of these at any time, uh, scale it up, scale it down when the CPU load gets high or low. So, so everything is handled by Kubernetes uh, and uh, this is what we are going to leverage with Kubeflow. So Kubeflow has many different um, parts. Uh, it ships with many different technologies. Uh, we are going to look at uh, pipelines and a little bit uh, to Jupyter notebooks, but you can also do hyperparameter tunings. It comes with uh, Katib, uh, an open source library, um, then TF job for training, and uh, it also has uh, serving so you can serve your models in Kubeflow. Uh, by the way, Kubeflow is also completely open source, so you can find it on, on GitHub. Um, just a, a few words of um, notebooks. Uh, basically, why notebooks are important is because uh, machine learning engineers, they, they don't have to leave their favorite environment. So when you're working with uh, Python and machine learning, you try out your code, uh, you do some programming in, in a notebook, um, and if you want to deploy that code or interact with your Kubeflow deployment, you don't have to, to leave uh, your Jupyter notebooks that you get uh, natively from uh, Kubeflow. And all these notebook servers are run as containers on top of Kubernetes. So you have these servers running in your Kubernetes cluster, you don't have to deploy new servers. So it's a native way to interact with the Kubeflow deployment, and it's uh, it's very convenient. So, um, but the, the, the most important thing I like to talk about today is uh, Kubeflow pipelines. So what are pipelines? Basically, pipelines let you build machine learning pipelines that are reusable, shareable, uh, reproducible, uh, they are multi-environment, and they, they are scalable. So all these things, uh, we're going to break down uh, how you can achieve this uh, in the next couple of slides. So first, looking at shareability and uh, reusability. This is how the UI looks for a pipeline. So you see you have uh, different steps and uh, components. And basically, the whole pipeline is shareable. So the, the definition of a pipeline is a, is a YAML file. And you can share that YAML file with, with anyone. And you also have the containers or these uh, components. And the components are also uh, shareable the same way with the, with the YAML file. Uh, so for example, in, in uh, Google Cloud, you have AI Hub, which is a, a service where you can share uh, different machine learning related things. Uh, one of the things that you can share other than uh, TensorFlow models and, and code is uh, Kubeflow pipelines and components. So you can just uh, register a, a free account and go to um, a Google Cloud Console 
and uh, check out all these uh, uh, public, uh, re publicly shared uh, resources, basically, in AI Hub. And when you have your own organization, uh, you can also choose to, to share something within your organization so you don't have to make it public. But you can also make it publicly available for others to use. Uh, really, really good resources here, very good examples. So if you are into machine learning and you want to learn a bit more about Kubeflow, I highly recommend really, really nice documentations for each of them, uh, very easy to use and get started. Um, yes, and you can also import uh, these components from uh, a URL. So if you, if you take the URL from AI Hub, for example, uh, you can find the YAML file and you can import it from there. So you see in, in, in code, it's just uh, calling the, the API load component from URL, and then you specify the URL to, to the YAML file. Um, and you, can, you could also load it from like a, uh, a local file if you have the local file uh, YAML. And then you can see some info about it with the help, and it's really easy to, to include it in, a, in an actual pipeline. So multi-environment uh, and, and scalability. So this is basically given as all of these components are going to be run on Kubernetes. If you, if you have uh, Kubernetes on-prem, and you have another Kubernetes on, in the cloud, or you have a multi-cloud or, or hybrid uh, Kubernetes setup, your pipeline is going to run the same way in all these different environments. So you just develop your pipelines once. And because everything is a container, you don't have to worry about uh, the architecture. You don't have to worry about the dependencies. Everything is containerized. And you can run the same uh, pipelines in any of these environments. And they are going to scale because uh, if you have a big enough cluster, of course. Um, and they are reproducible. So um, when, you, when you deploy a pipeline, you upload it uh, through the UI, and then you, you can start experiments. And in the experiments, you can have multiple runs of the same pipeline with different inputs. And you can then later see all the runs, and you can compare them, check the inputs, check the outputs. So you can see with all these experiments running the pipelines, it gets reproducible. You can clone a run. Just click the, the clone run button, and you will get uh, the same experience. You can run it again, uh, test it out with maybe a little bit modifications. So um, and this is how actually a pipeline is uh, uh, built up. So you have the components. Uh, each component has inputs, and then each component has outputs, and they can have uh, artifacts. So uh, how you set up the pipeline is you define the inputs and the outputs to uh, a component, and the Kubeflow automatically builds up this graph for you. So you don't have to, to tell which components comes after which one. You just say that, okay, the output of this component is going to be the input for this component, and uh, then Kubeflow will handle this and uh, build up the graph. And the, the, the inputs for the, first, uh, for the first components are going to be the ones that you can specify when you run the pipeline in the UI. So uh, that's something that you can specify for each run and then compare the results based on those inputs. Um, and artifacts, uh, those are really interesting things. So basically, any component can generate artifacts uh, that you can later look at. Uh, in the UI in a convenient way. So these artifacts can be static HTML pages, uh, tables, confusion matrices, um, ROC curves, uh, and you can later then just look at these in a rich visualization. Uh, I will show the example uh, at the demo when we get there. So some best practices, uh, how inputs and outputs are handled is that inputs are read as command line arguments and outputs are provided by writing to a local file in that container, and then Kubeflow picks up that file, reads the, uh, reads the content of the file, and handles that content as the output of the container or the, the component. And because of this, you want to, do, uh, you want to separate small inputs and outputs uh, from big ones, because if, you, if your component needs to read two gigabytes of data for training, you're not going to communicate that through, the, through a command line argument. So for small inputs, uh, you want to read from a command line argument. And for small outputs, you, you write it to a file. 
uh, for uh, bigger inputs, you want to read the URL where the, uh, the container can find uh, that input, and then it's going to read from that online source. And for bigger outputs, you want to read uh, a URL where you should put that output, and then you write that output to that URL, and then you also output uh, this URL again so that later stages can, can pick that up. So it's really important to think of all these components as something that's reusable or like it's a plug and play, like you're playing with Lego. So you take these bricks and put it to, to, to other pieces and you can, you can play with it. So for this reason, you always want to also output uh, the, the URLs where you actually stored the output, the, the big ones, the, the gigabyte outputs. Um, yeah, okay, uh, a bonus best practice is to use um, things like uh, TensorFlow's uh, G file to, to read uh, inputs and, and outputs from different sources uh, because it can handle multiple things like uh, cloud sources like Google Cloud Storage or S3 uh, or local files and then uh, based on the URL it will know whether it's a local file or, or it's in the cloud. So you, that way it's even more reusable, uh, your component. And then some best practices around containers when you're building pipelines is that you want to generalize as much as possible. So we will see, for example, uh, if you're writing a, a machine learning model, um, let's say a, a, a deep neural network, you want to make it uh, such that the number of layers and the number of neurons in each layer might be a parameter. And because if you, if you build the component this way, then whenever you create a new run for that pipeline, you can specify that and you can experiment it without changing the code. So it's going to be really uh, a flexible and fast way to iterate and, and uh, get new, new runs and uh, see the output of all those. So generalize as much as you can and uh, read as many things as you can from input. And then in a pipeline, uh, uh, when you're specifying uh, a container, in the YAML file, so which container uh, refers to this component. You want to refer to a tag or version um, and think about whether you want to use latest or not. If you refer to a given tag, then it becomes more... Re uh, so after a couple months, when you look back at the run, if you use the latest, you will have no idea uh, actually which container was that. Uh, but in some other cases, you might want to use latest. So. So I will, I will show some examples around that. Uh, and there's just something you, you have to think about. Yeah, so how do you actually create these components? You can uh, use a container, so write your own code, write your own application, containerize it, um, uh, push that container to a registry, uh, any public registry uh, that you have access to, and then, and then just use it. If you have uh, an application from any other sources that you containerize, you can use uh, wrapper scripts to handle uh, the, the input and output the way you want to do it. So just use wrapper scripts. Um, here, uh, by the way, uh, let, let, let me check the time. Yeah, I have 15 minutes. Okay, so um, uh, here in the code, you can see that basically uh, this is just a cloud SDK image from Google. So you get the, the gsutil command, which is interacting with the, the Google storage. So you can read files from there. And, uh, and so it just uses this container. And uh, you specify the command arguments. And uh, it's really easy. Then uh, the next thing you can do is just use lightweight Python functions. So when you are coding and writing your own Python function, uh, test it out in the notebook, you can turn that into a container without any knowledge about how containers work. You don't have to know how to containerize anything, what the Docker file is. You just write your, your function as a self-contained function, so you have all the import statements in the function that you're going to use. And if you need any helper functions, you define all those as well inside the function. And then uh, basically, with one line of code, you can turn this into a component, and uh, Kubeflow will figure out how to make a container out of that uh, one function. So this is a very convenient way to, to handle small components. And then, of course, as I mentioned, you can import from a local YAML file or an, a URL that hosts uh, the YAML file for the component. So there can be that option as well. 
And now um, to, to the part of how to actually organize your work around this. So if you have a one-man team, you're the only one working on a machine learning project, uh, you, can, you can just use a single notebook and never leave that notebook and write everything there, submit pipelines from there, uh, containerize your functions without any knowledge of containers. So it's a very fast and easy way to iterate on your code and uh, on your models. Um, also, you don't need any other expertise from, from machine learning. You just write your machine learning code and don't worry about infrastructure, DevOps, uh, CI, CD, nothing really. But if you have, like in a big company, you have a big team, uh, then you can uh, publish enterprise level code into containers, uh, build a CI CD pipeline uh, that whenever you push some code, then it gets containerized and uh, the container is gets pushed to, to a registry and uh, basically use all the familiar um, collaboration and CI CD tools that you are already using. So you can use uh, Git, you can use uh, whatever uh, CI CD service uh, that, you're, that you're using. And uh, then you can share your components and pipelines within your organization or within your team. And of course, you can have even bigger teams or multiple teams. So there might be a team who is composed of data scientists and they handle data cleaning and data preprocessing for you. Oh, sorry, you had a question? No, no okay. Um, um, so who handles uh, preprocessing and, and uh, basically the, the data science part, then they can write just one component, containerize it, uh, push that container to a registry and then specify the YAML for that component. And there then someone else can write the training or another team can write the training code. And then some other team can write the analytics code. So, so all these different teams can work on their own components. And then you only need one pipeline that builds up from these components. Uh, you have to coordinate the inputs and outputs. And, and then you have the whole pipeline. And then anyone without any machine learning knowledge can run this pipeline, see the outputs, uh, test it on the test cluster, move it to the production cluster. Uh, so, so all these things can be done then uh, very easy. Um, so it's a really nice way for, for different big teams to collaborate with each other. So I think we, we can jump into the demo now. Uh, let's see here. So this is how um, a Kubeflow looks like. Maybe I can make it a bit bigger. Yeah. Is it OK? Everyone can see it? All right, so this is how it looks like. You, you have the different options that I mentioned here. So if we look at notebooks, uh, I have one uh, server running. I can connect to it. And then I get all the, the different uh, files that I have in that server. I can jump into my uh, nice uh, notebooks. So here, for example, all, all this function does is that it reads an input path and an output path, and then reads the file from the input path, duplicates it, and uh, writes it to the output path as uh, output one and output two. Um, you can test out these functions here in the notebook. And then I can create a component from it, uh, just like this, with one line of code. And then I create two more uh, uh, two more components from the given uh, uh, container images uh, that you can specify also here in the code. Uh, I have another function. So what this pipeline does is that it duplicates the file and then counts the number of words, counts the number of lines, and then combine those two results, uh, checking whether the number of lines is zero or not. So you can have conditional uh, components as well that only run if a certain condition is met because I don't want to divide by zero. But basically, uh, the final component just gives you an average of uh, the number of uh, uh, words per line or number of characters. Yes, and then this is how it looks like. So I just have uh, a pipeline definition. I use the pipeline decorator 
and then give the secret. So this is just to make sure that it can access the cloud services that I'm using, mostly the storage. And um, then from here, I can compile the pipeline. This is going to create a zip file for me uh, that just contains my YAML. And then I can specify the, the arguments, which are the inputs for the first components. And I can basically start it from here. So I can create an experiment. And then in that experiment, I can run this pipeline. So if I do this, uh, yes. Uh, pom, pom, pom. Maybe I have to rerun the previous cells as well. I think this experiment I. It already exists, it might work. Okay, let's say IT next two. Yep, I get a link to the experiment. And I also get a link to my run, so I can check it out. Should be started. Yes, so I can see that it's running. If we go back to the Kubeflow UI. I can go to my pipelines. Here I have all the, the other pipelines I already uploaded. I can upload a new one from a file. I have the pipeline YAML here. I can name it something. Yeah, and if I come here, I can check out how it looks like. I can even see the source, so the YAML is pretty long. But it's generated automatically from Python code, so you don't have to write these YAML files and construct yourself. You can just write Python code and uh, get this YAML file. And then I can go to experiments. I have a couple ones. Yeah, here's the one that we just created. I can create a new one. Um, And now I can create a run. So I just choose the pipeline that I uploaded. It's going to be this one. The run name is going to be. Um, so I, I like to name my runs based on the parameters that I, I give. So for example, here, I'm going to set the hidden layer size to 1,500, uh, the number of steps to 3,000, and the learning rate to 0 0.1. So this is how I'm going to name my run just to make sure that later I know which runs uh, did what. Um, specify the different inputs. Yeah, uh, local mode, so I can either run it uh, locally, which is going to run the whole pipeline inside the containers, or what you can also do with Kubeflow, you can uh, go and call other services. So for example, if you're using uh, Google Cloud, there are different services that do model training for you or hyperparameter tuning for you, data preprocessing. If you have a Spark or a Hadoop cluster and you want to run a Spark job as the preprocessing stage, you can call out and submit a Spark job uh, as a part of the pipeline. But now I'm just going to run it locally because it's faster. I don't have uh, too much data. And I can click Start here. And uh, now I have this run. I can click on the run. I'm going to show a couple things and then hope that the run fails. Because I also want to show how to fix it. Um, so I have uh, the first stage. You would see the artifacts here. Um, uh, this stage doesn't have any artifacts, uh, especially since it's just started. And then I can see the logs. So it's really nice. You can see the, the Kubernetes logs uh, streamed in real time uh, on the Kubeflow UI. So that's really nice. We are going to come back to this run once it fails. Uh, but for now, we're going to check out some previous ones that I already started. So I have a couple ones here. You can see that um, the accuracy score and the ROC uh, score is shown here. So I can compare my different runs. I can even go into these runs and uh, look at the outputs. 
so I can see all these nice um, visualizations. Uh, as I said, these are the artifacts, the tables, um, the confusion matrix. I have uh, an ROC curve here, uh, some static HTML content that one of the containers produces. So it's very nice. Uh, and what other thing I can do is that I can also click multiple ones and click compare runs. So this is pretty nice uh, because you can see the different parameters side by side. Uh, I can see uh, the tensor boards. I can see the, the static HTML content, co uh, content next to each other. I get an aggregated view of uh, the graphs, for example. So I can zoom in here. I can see it and uh, compare the two runs, basically. So I think it's a very nice and convenient uh, way to, to run experiments. As, and as I showed, uh, this is where I can specify. So you, have, you, you see I have different uh, neural network architectures here, uh, with this one having, uh, for example, three layers with 100 neurons each. This is just one layer, but 1,500 neurons. So I can compare this. So this is very useful for um, ML scientists who just want to experiment with different uh, model architectures, neural network architectures, but they don't want to care about data pre-processing. They don't care about the, the, the other parts of the pipeline. Uh, they, they might not even know where this is running. They, they just have a very convenient UI where they can experiment. But yeah, so, 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 so different teams can collaborate. Um, yeah, I have two minutes. Yeah, OK. Uh, that's perfect. So let's hope that uh, the previous run failed. Yes, excellent. So, so what happened here? Oops, uh, the pre-processing is not working. Something is not good. Uh, yes, yeah, some logs. Okay. So, I mean, I'm a I'm a machine learning expert. I, I wrote the, the machine learning code. I just want to try out some uh, neural network architectures. I I don't know what's going on with the pre-processing. So. What do I do? Uh, well, I guess I call my colleague, uh, Jason, who unfortunately couldn't come. Uh, but if he would be here, he would be doing that part. And he just um, goes, fixes some code, uh, containerizes his pre-processing uh, uh, pi uh, pipeline part, and then uh, pushes that uh, Docker code. This is pretty small, so you can't see, but this is a Docker push. Uh, maybe I can make it bigger, actually. Yeah. So I'm just uh, some uh, pushing some other uh, code, uh, basically a, a Docker image. And now I can, he calls me, hey, I fixed the pre-processing. So I just create a, a copy of the pipeline. And I can start it. And now if we wait, we will see that this is not going to fail. Because um, as you can see in the pipeline here, that's the experiment. Here is the pipeline as a source. Uh, so you specify the image name here. And this is always pulling the latest image. So it's going to pull the new image whenever I start the run. So this way, I can collaborate really easily with other teams. And I don't have to worry about their parts. They can fix their parts. I can fix mine part. And then the whole pipeline just runs flawlessly. And basically, I don't even have to leave this uh, Kubeflow UI to, to iterate on the code with others. Um, so with that, uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, thank you very much. And uh, please, uh, I will be here. So, so come to me, or uh, I, I guess I can put up my emails again uh, if you want to reach me. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, maybe we have one minute for questions or something. We, we, can, we can do one question if yeah. we want. It's right before the open topics. OK, maybe they should just find you if, yeah, if anyone definitely. has a question they're yeah. too embarrassed to ask. Right. It's all right. Okay. Let's, give, let's give a hand. Thank you very much. And I believe the topics for the, the open session or whatever it is are as down in the main room that we, we did the JavaScript stuff in. Uh, if it's not there, I'm sorry. I don't remember what the guy showed me uh, at the start of this talk. Uh, I got distracted with Kubeflow.